Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third event in our Black History Month series. I am thrilled that so many of you chose to join us because I think we have a really, really great conversation today. Today, I'm fortunate to sit down with Dr. Michael Lomax. Uh, Dr. Lomax has served for almost 20 years as the president and CEO of the United Negro College Fund, or better known as UNCF. Uh, during the time of his leadership, this uh, long and storied organization has raised more than $3 billion and helped more than 100,000 students earn college degrees and start their careers. Um, we're gonna spend a lot of today's session, in fact, most of it, talking about Michael's stewardship of UNCF and historically black colleges and how he sees the history and future and contribution of those institutions. But it would be really unfair to Michael uh, to just characterize and introduce him as the president and CEO of UNCF. He has had such a storied career that I really wanna start with him a little bit. As I said, for almost two decades, he's been the face really of UNCF, but he's also over the course of his career, he's been a scholar and an educator. He's been an innovator in the arts and culture. He's been a groundbreaking elected official and many, many other things. So Michael, I wanna start by just giving you a chance to maybe share a little bit more about your background and then maybe segue by telling us how those early experiences help shape you and help shape your leadership of UNCF. Well, first of all, let me say how excited I am to be here and to have an opportunity to spend some time with you and uh, your colleagues. Um, you know, I was born in Los Angeles in post-World War II uh, period that uh, was, you know, a, a time of economic expansion, but also a time of incredible civil rights uh, activity. And my parents owned a little weekly newspaper and my mother wrote it and my dad produced it. And uh, they'd been doing that in, throughout the 1940s. And in the 1950s, uh, as the civil rights movement began in the South, my mom decided that she wanted to go South to cover it. And so in 1956, she took a week off from raising six kids and writing a newspaper and went to Montgomery, Alabama uh, to cover the bus boycott. She met Dr. King, Coretta King, had dinner at their home, uh, met Rosa Parks and other leaders of the civil rights movement. And it was really a transformational event for her personally. She came back and said, this is the story of my journalistic career. And I wanna spend more time in the South. My parents didn't agree on that. And so my dad stayed in California. My mom uh, took six kids to Alabama wow. in 1961. And wow. I went from attending uh, Montgomery, I mean, uh, Mount Vernon Junior High School in Los Angeles to, to attending uh, Tuskegee Institute High School in rural Macon County, Alabama, where a lot of my classmates were the sons and daughters of sharecroppers, uh, where the janitor rode to school on a mule that grazed out in front of the, the, the school and the, and the uh, the junior high school that I was at had pot-bellied stoves uh, that were fed with, uh, you know, wood. I mean, this was like, this was the real South and where we had the uh, textbooks that had been at the white high school and white junior high school and then sent to us when they were no longer uh, of use to them. And so I, I experienced educational inequality. I, I, we did, we, we, didn't stay, we stayed six months there, but over the next four years, went in and out of the South. And in 1964, my mom dropped me off at Morehouse College. I was 16 years old. Uh, and I started my, my college uh, matriculation there uh, with about 300 other young black men who were uh, freshmen. I was the only one from Los Angeles. I was 2000 miles from home. Mm -hmm. And I spent four transformational years at Morehouse College. In my senior year of, high school, of college, uh, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated mm -hmm. and the funeral was on, on the Morehouse campus. And Dr. King lay in state in the um, chapel at Spelman. And my job during the funeral was to take VIP visitors who came from all over the world over to the chapel to 
uh, pay their final respects. It was an open casket. And I must have, over the course of those few days, uh, stood next to and looked down into that casket um, hundreds of times. And I, I focus on that because that was a transformational event in my life. Uh, I'd met Dr. King 10 years earlier at the beginning of his ministry when he visited Los Angeles in 1957. He was a young, dapper, pleasant guy, came over to the house, had ice cream and cake, and my mother interviewed him and uh, watched him on the black and white TV for the next decade. And, and then my senior year of high school, of, of college, he's dead, and, he's, and he'd given his life so that we could have a different kind of life. And it was at that point that I made a decision, uh, Alan, that whatever I did professionally, um, and it's still hard to talk about that because it's, it's a very emotional event for me. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, you know, whatever my life would hold professionally, I had to do something that we were often told in chapel at Morehouse. I had to make a difference. I had to be a leader. I had to try to impact the world that we were in. And so... Although I decided that I would be a college professor and although I decided that I would major in English and teach English at Morehouse College and Spelman College, that uh, I wanted to do something else. I wasn't a great orator, so I wasn't going to be like Dr. King. But when the opportunity to serve in local government arose, I went and worked for the first black mayor of Atlanta. And then I said, well, if Maynard Jackson can run for mayor. I can run for something. And I ran for the Fulton County Commission and I won and I served there for a decade. As you, you were the first. You were the first African American to chair that commission, right? Yeah, and you know, and uh, you know, most people say what's well, Fulton County. They don't say that anymore because it, Fulton County is very much in the news as a result of last year's elections. I ran for mayor. I didn't succeed, and I didn't challenge it though. I believed that the vote was it was accurate, <laughs> and I decided 25 years ago to go back into higher education and try to do on college campuses, uh, what Dr. Mays and others at Morehouse had said, and that was to make a difference. And so I've really spent the last quarter of a century trying to build up my bona fides as an education leader, not only to produce more black college graduates at Dillard University and now at the work that I do at UNCF, but to produce them not just so that they would live better lives, but so that we could really address some of the you know, the, the larger uh, challenges that face uh, the Black community and our country with uh, a new generation of Black college graduates who are leaders uh, in their local communities, in their states, and in the nation. Great. Michael, uh, first, thanks for sharing that personal story. That was far better than I could have done with any introduction. Like, there's so many things just in that story that could be the subject of an hour long fireside chat in and of themselves from your mother's early experience, your family transition, your early experiences. But one thing's clear, uh, this notion of experience, commitment and mission with black colleges has been there for you um, almost since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanna kind of pick up on that Mm -hmm. and then pivot the conversation to talk about Black colleges and about UNCF. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on a surface level, UNCF has probably one of the best known mottos of all time. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. I think everybody knows that motto, except maybe Dan Quayle. Um, <laughs> uh, yet, yet there are a lot of people who don't actually know what UNCF, what UNCF is, why it exists, mm -hmm. and how it got started. And yeah. maybe without going into too much, maybe we just level yeah. set yeah. by telling that story briefly. Well, UNCF was founded after World War II in 1944 by one of the great social entrepreneurs of the 20th century, Frederick Douglass Patterson, who was the third president of Tuskegee Institute. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Patterson was an innovator. You know, um, he, he was the he was the third president of Tuskegee, he started in the 1930s, and he decided, and if you've ever been to rural Macon County, Alabama, that he would in 1930s say, I want an aviation program at this institution, you had to be a visionary. Right. Uh, and then to, to actually make it happen, you had to be very industrious. And he, he, was a, he was an aviator, he flew airplanes, and then he said, 
uh, as he saw the war was going to break out, he said, and he, he heard that there was going to be, that in World War II, they would train black aviators. He's, he got them to create a program for the federal government on the Tuskegee campus. He created the Tuskegee Airmen. And as they say, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So he's a guy who could have big ideas. At the end of the war, he said, black people are going to come back from the war, from the war industries, women and men, and they're going to they're going to get educations and they're going to push the country to give them more opportunities in in the in, in the private sector. And so he he called all the black college presidents together and he's challenged them to create a United Negro College fundraising organization. They enlisted John D. Rockefeller to be the chair of the first campaign. They raised $750,000 in 1944, which was the equivalent of $10 million. And in the 78 succeeding years, we've raised $5 billion and helped a half million students you know, go to and graduate from school. So we do three kinds of things uh, to do that. One is that we support historic private historically black colleges. There are over a hundred black colleges. There are 37 of them are members of UNCF, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, Xavier University, uh, Bennett College for Women. Those are members of UNCF, but we also support all HBCUs, but we support the colleges. The second thing we do is we support students who want to go to college. And our iconic motto, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, which was created by Vernon Jordan during the one year he was executive director of the United <laughs> Negro College. But you know, Vernon could do it in one year what the rest of us would take decades. To do. Right. He creates that motto with uh, Young and Rubicamp, raises tens of millions of dollars to help provide scholarships. So we've become the largest private provider of scholarships uh, to students of color in this country. At our peak, we were giving about $100 million a year away in scholarships. That now is around $70 million, but we, we also, you know, 30, 40, $50 million in support to colleges. And the third thing that we do is we advocate, and you'll appreciate this because you did some of that. Mm -hmm. We advocate with the federal government to get more support for black colleges, and we advocate publicly for philanthropy and corporations to support black students and their colleges on their journey to educational equality. So that's what we do. And we've been doing that for 78 years and we do it pretty well. That's great. And we're gonna come back to some of those themes, particularly the second and third theme. Uh, you mentioned my prior career in advocacy. I also had a little bit of time at UNCF at that mm -hmm. time. UNCF pretty much only supported uh, the, the, at that time it was 41 private historic with black colleges and the students going there. And that mission has expanded substantially over your tenure. And we'll talk about that more mm -hmm. in, in just a minute. But I, just as a, as a second part of maybe really level setting on, on UNCF and its, its legacy and, and, and what it does. So, you know, you mentioned Dr. King earlier, um, other great men like Frederick Patterson, yourself, you're a UNCF grad. Many people, I think, know that HBCUs produced historical giants like these and others, Thurgood Marshall, of course, mm -hmm. um, but not as many, I think, realize that these colleges and universities continue to produce like excellence and leadership today. And there are mm -hmm. lots of names I could mention, um, but among them, Roz Brewer, who's the CEO of Walgreens. She's also the former president and COO of Starbucks. She's a Spelman College grad. Um, my wife never lets me forget that because she's a Spelman College grad. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, Letitia James, of course, was the first Black female New York State Attorney General. They're both Howard grads. Oprah Winfrey is a Tennessee State University alum. And as I said, there are a lot, lot more names. And so the question that I have is, is there something differentiated about HBCUs that has contributed to this track record of success and, and if there is, tell us a little bit about what the experience is like for students and how it might look different than other places. You know, you, you called out the roll call and, you know, you could add Toni Morrison, you could add, you know, there's a whole bunch of other people that you could add to that. Martin yep. Luther King, obviously. But what I think has, and I, I want to get to what's, what's the differentiator. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I would say is historically black colleges have essentially built the black middle class. 
-hmm. If you think about it, after the Civil War, uh, you, you know, there were a handful of people that could go to uh, white institutions, but there were actually no institutions until historically black colleges were founded where black folks could go from illiteracy to literacy uh, and to a degree in one generation. And so they have been doing that work for now over 165 years. And they built the middle class. And so people may not know that they know a lot of black college graduates, but they do because the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, uh, the civil servants, uh, the pro black professionals who are breaking their way into, you know, breaking down barriers are disproportionately going to be uh, those first and second generation black folks who get a degree and they get them in a historically black college. People ask me, what's the secret sauce of, of, of historically black colleges? And I mm -hmm. think, you know, part, because they're not rich, they're not the wealthiest institutions. They don't always have uh, the flashiest campuses and the, you know, the, the most extraordinary buildings. What their secret sauce is, that they create an environment which is nurturing and supportive of the students who attend. Uh, we don't, when you come to an HBCU, people are gonna ask you, uh, they're gonna say welcome, and they're gonna extend the right hand of friendship to you, and they're gonna say, we're gonna help you realize your dream. You, they're not gonna say, you're not, you shouldn't be here, you're a fraud, you got here on affirmative action. They're gonna say, we're gonna do everything we can to lift you up and, and put you on the road we ask only one thing of you, Al, and that as you climb, you reach back and pull others with you. And that's really what I think is the secret sauce. And that is that lift as you climb and uh, that, that warm, nurturing, supportive environment. I never experienced, I mean, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a third generation college graduate in my family. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Los Angeles. I had all those opportunities. I never felt as embraced and supported as I did when I got to Morehouse and I became a better student. So I think that, that it isn't always, do you have the, you know, the latest equipment and the, you know, the best looking dorms it's, have you created an environment which is going to help you socially and emotionally. And there's a lot of talk today about social emotional learning. That's what black colleges do. They create a warm nurturing and embracing environment and they are very good at moving people from the bottom up. And so, you know, uh, over 75% of our students are Pell eligible. That means they're low income. Over 50% of our students are the first in their families to go to college. We're the place where black, black families get on that ladder that takes them up. And I think that's what we do. We do it very well. We're good at it. Uh, you know, we've done a lot with a little. My goal is to get a lot so that we can do a lot more. Great, great. I want to pick up on that last thing you said about getting people on the ladder. Um, we talked earlier, and you described uh, UNCF and its mission in a lot of different ways. And we're going to now get into how that mission has evolved and expanded. But one of the things I remember, because it stuck with me, you described UNCF as a talent machine. Um, and its impact on uh, social mobility and it was, a, it was a vision that was much broader than just education. While education is certainly at the core and it's a core engine, the, the, the vision was much broader than just education. I wonder if you could maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I think education is the enabler. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it can be an end in and of itself, but it really is, it gives you the, it, it gives you the, 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 the tools the capability to achieve your vision, your dream, your aspirations for yourself. Um, and uh, so it's the tool. And so I think in that sense, you know, a, a lot of what we do is we help young people figure out what their gifts are. You know, that, that you know, you know I, I looked at Martin Luther King and I said, I want to be like him. And I thought that meant I'm going to be a great orator. What it meant was I could serve, I could make a difference, I could help transform the world. And, but I do it this way, I, by running an organization, not by uh, giving my life for my people. 
I think that for me, uh, you know, the the real opportunity, the, the real purpose that these ins- that that we're increasingly playing is how do we enable this? Ta- how do we identify talent, and then how do we enable that talent? to do what most of us spend so much of our life doing, working in careers which are rewarding and and, uh, uh, motivating and that make the best use of the talents and gifts that we have. And I think that that's increasingly a lot of what we're doing. We're really saying we're a talent engine. We help you identify what your talents, your skills, your gifts are. And then we help to link you to the greater opportunities that are that are occurring in this country, and you know this, that today, uh, all the best jobs, all the best careers, are are jobs which require skills and capabilities beyond a high school diploma. Mm-hmm. And so we we really and we're on a mission to ensure that more black people, women and men, get those opportunities because they've gotten the education that's the right one for them. When I first set foot on the Spelman College campus in 1964, uh, I remember one of the buildings where I took some classes because there were, was in, in where they taught home economics, home economics in 1964. And that's something that was, was still being taught uh, to, to young black women on a college campus. Today, That's where computer science is taught at Spelman College. That's where mathematics is taught at Spelman College. And so Spelman has said, you know, we we come from a a tradition where we prepare black women to challenge the expectations and to live in rich lives. And when you talk about Roz Brewer, you know, Roz Brewer, first generation college student, first generation college student, she majors in engineering at Spelman College. Is she an engineer? Was she an engineer when she was CEO at Sam's Club? Was she an engineer when she was COO at Starbucks? Was she an engineer when she was C- as CEO of, of Walgreens? No, she is a business executive. She is a leader. And who gave her the confidence to keep pushing her skill building and her capability building? It was Spelman College that recognized in this black woman, that she, this young black girl, that she had the capability to be a leader. And what is she doing today? She's chair of the board of Spelman College and she's lifting others as she climbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, her story is amazing. And uh, thanks for sharing a little bit more of it, uh, as well as you know, talking about what you mean by, by the talent machine. You know, the, the thing I'm struck by is that if you take this notion of a talent machine, one of the things UNCF has done over the last uh, decades is to expand its focus on that talent machine beyond the 37 member colleges and universities. I, I, re- I think, if I make no mistake, that started um, maybe a little bit even under your predecessor, but you expanded it significantly. I looked at some numbers um, and they told me that um, UNCF has provided scholarships for students of color uh, in excess of 10,000 students in an excess of 1,000 schools. Yeah. And I wanted to just understand more about how you think about that and balancing that with this core mission around the 37 uh, private historically black colleges and universities. And, and then there are a few other specific yeah. projects I want to ask you about after that. So actually it, this, the work of expanding the reach of, of UNCF began with my predecessor and your former boss, mm-hmm. uh, Bill Gray. And, you know, Bill was uh, a member of Congress. He was the house majority whip, but he was also when he stepped down from that and became president and CEO of UNCF, he was on the board of J.P. Morgan Chase. He was on the board of Dell. He was on the board of uh, MetLife. He had all of these relationships in the business community. And one of the people he met early on was Bill Gates and Melinda. And he challenged them 
to think about supporting black colleges and black students. And they challenged him. He, they said, we'll give you $1 billion to provide 1,000 scholarships a year, 35% of which go to black students, 35% of which go to Hispanic students, 15% of which goes to Asian Pacific Islanders, and 15% of which goes to tribal uh, to, to Native Americans. What we want you to do is give them, and they will each get full rides to go to the, the institution that they want to go, that they think will serve them best. And over the 20 years that we did that program, and they gave another 600 million, so that total program was $1.6 billion. It helped 20,000, it helped 10,000 students, let me get this right, 20,000 students over the 20 years of the program. Right. Uh, that program had, students went to Harvard, to MIT, and to HBCUs, and to tribal colleges, but we had a 90 over a 90% completion rate because we removed the financial barriers and we let the student choose where they wanted to go. And we learned that when you, you take that financial consideration away from a low, and every one of those students was low income and first generation. And when you remove that barrier, that really lifts the students up. And if, then you, if they go to a school where they're feeling like they're valued and appreciate that they, they're even more successful. So, you know, we, we've demonstrated that with that program from Bill and Melinda Gates was that we could, that, that the, the biggest obstacle facing so many high-performing low-income students isn't their ability to do the work. It's their ability to pay for the, the college education. It's the ability to focus all of their attention on that and not worry about how am I going to pay tuition? How am I going to pay for the books? How am I going to... Um, you know, take the pressure off of my family? How am I not going to take out loans? So that, that was a big learning for us. And, and it showed us that we could do that work at scale. But it also made us, uh, and, and we helped create the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. We helped the Asian Pacific Islanders build their own scholarship fund. And we worked with our Native American uh, partners. And we have been advocating with them for more federal support for those programs. So that's been a big piece of of our more expansive vision. But today we're very focused on looking at all historically black colleges and saying, how do we take them? And they have on average a 40% graduation rate over a six year period. How do we get more students to succeed at those schools? Mm -hmm. How do we make those schools even stronger academically? How do we make them better run enterprises and how do we get more resources to them so that they too can remove the financial barrier and help these young people soar? Just think what it would be like if instead of 50,000 graduates annually, because we got the graduation rate up to 90%, we had 100,000 graduates every year leaving black colleges and going into uh, the workforce. So that's, you know, our, our goal right now is to even be to, to make sure that these institutions are even more effective in producing 21st century graduates who are ready to get out there and compete in the 21st century economy. Right, and I, I know that, um, you know, as part of that, you and, you and UNCF have been focusing on things like capacity building, um, and I'm not sure if it's related, but you also told me about a project that you're initiating, I think, with Thurgood Marshall called the Audacity Project. Can you talk about those two things and how, how they fit in? Well, we have been invited. There's, there's, a, there's an, something called the Audacious Project, and it's a TED. It's embedded in TED, and they uh, invite a handful of organizations every year to compete, to offer up a big idea. Uh, and to compete for uh, what could be up to $100 million of investment in bringing that idea to life. And if you know anything about the Audacious Project, a lot of what they're focused on is inequality, inequity, and removing obstacles to opportunity, to mobility, moving people out of extreme poverty into sustainable living, uh, sustainable economic life. And so what we want to do, so much of American education is very focused on 
how do you turn more institutions into very elite institutions? How do you make them more exclusive? How do you improve their graduation rate? How do you get the best students to apply? And I think that's important. And we have some schools that are highly competitive. Spelman College, I was talking to the president there. She said we had 13,000 applications for our freshman class, you know, you know, the most we've ever had. So, you know, these are highly competitive positions. But I actually want to, to work with some of our institutions, which are open admissions, open enrollment. Mm -hmm. And I want to figure out how we can be more successful in reaching deep into the communities of poverty, which often surround HBCUs, and lifting people out of those communities onto the campuses and getting them the skills so that they then can take advantage of the jobs which are increasingly coming into the regions where these HBCUs are. And, and you know, that's, that for me would be taking our economic mobility, our social mobility, our ability to move people out of poverty and putting it on steroids. Because, you know, uh, we're a nation today of extremes. We have, uh, uh, you know, very wealthy people who are getting, you know, the full benefits of this market economy. And then we have people on the bottom who don't have the skills which enable them to, to access great careers and opportunities. And I wanna move more people from that poverty into that because you, know, you do it in the first generation. Somebody moves from poverty into the middle class. They can go from the bottom two quintiles into the, you know, the, the 60th percent or but by the second generation, they're pulling up family members and their, their families are in the middle class. And what I wanna do is to, to see how HBCUs, and this is uh, what we're thinking about with Thurgood Marshall, how some of our HBCUs can move not just individuals, not just, not just families, but entire neighborhoods and communities from poverty to sustainable and that is the sort of the big idea that we're working on right now. That's great. I, you know, I don't know that it, it sounds like it's in the early stages of development, but that notion of, you know, it's, it's again, another place where you're talking about expanding beyond a narrower definition of an educational mission to a broader definition. And if there's anything more you can say about what the visualization is for the community impact with you and Thurgood Marshall, that would be great. Or, or maybe it's maybe it's too early. It's just in well, the, I would the I would just say this, and that is here's what we do know. Mm -hmm. There are a hundred plus HBCUs. They employ a hundred and forty thousand people. Mm -hmm. They have an annual economic impact by the study that we did in 2015 of nearly $15 billion annually. They are mostly located in black neighborhoods and black communities. They are the anchors of those communities. And so what I'm asking is, yeah, they're, they're there and they're doing their work, but how do we leverage that to have this impact on the communities so that we don't move people out of the communities? We actually make the communities places where people who are who have great jobs and are doing uh, the work of the 21st century where they can feel like I can live here, I can raise my family here, I can stay here, I don't have to move out to the suburbs, I don't have to move across town, I can have that here. So we wanna, we wanna see if we can have a more intentional and strategic impact on creating st stronger communities as opposed to what we see happening in a lot of our cities and also around some of our HBCUs, gentrification, people move who want to be in the city, they're moving in the city, they're moving out the low income people, and they're taking that proximate to the downtown campus and turning it into something which doesn't look like the community that built that. Right, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's not, it's not universally the case, but it is often that as universities expand, you get more displacement than integration of that university into the community. So I, that sounds like a great, uh, great initiative um, that'll have a lot of impact. Um, I wanna try to con start to connect um, this discussion to sort of current events and recent events. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, you and I talked about was the impact of the pandemic 
on HBCUs. And I think, you know, like, like many institutions, there, there's reason to think that a pandemic might be really damaging for colleges in general, black colleges, you could see kind of a drying up and in, in donations, you could see any number of sort of negative potential uh, effects. But as you told me the story, what actually happened was almost the opposite. Can you, can you go through that for us? Well, when, uh, so let's turn the clock back to 24 months ago to March of 2020. And there's this word that there's gonna, there's a pandemic and we're, we're having our 77th uh, annual meeting in Washington, DC. And uh, Nancy Pelosi is speaking and we've got all these, these, these members of Congress and they're saying, this pandemic is real. It is going to happen and it's going to disrupt everything. And, and so we decided after that meeting and we, we just decided to shut down our operations in person to call off the fundraising events that we had going forward. And we were just going to hunker down and try to create a virtual UNCF. But we worried, Alan, that this could be an existential moment for UNCF and it could certainly be damaging for HBCUs. And one of our donors called me and said, "Um, I wanna give you, and he wanna do this with Thurgood Marshall, I wanna give you some additional millions of dollars to bring in uh, McKinsey and company to help you do, to to navigate your way through this. We want you to have world-class guidance on how you do uh, crisis management. We, we want you to have world-class guidance on how you do recovery, uh, stabilization. We want to give you world-class guidance on how you get into recovery. And then if we get to those three stages, we want to talk about transformation. And I said, oh, this seems like a good idea. And we began that work. And, and, and then we started seeing what the news was telling us. The news was telling us that this was impacting black people and low income people uh, disproportionately. And then in June of that same year, we, we saw a racial, um, um, you know, we, we, we saw renewed racism. We saw the murder of George Floyd. And we saw for both our students and our faculty, uh, and particularly our students, we, that, that this was having a very intense negative impact on them emotionally, psychologically, and economically, because 75% of our students are low income. And so we had to do a lot of things, uh, including get more federal support for black college students and low income college students, get more federal support to invest in stabilizing our institutions um, and also preparing them for when they would be able to reopen. And you fast forward 24 months and, and and, and because of the work that we've done, HBCUs are actually economically or financially in stronger condition than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. Their enrollments are flat or increasing. And you, you saw that institutions like community colleges, which have the same demographic of student, had double digit losses in enrollment. And so they're actually stronger and better able to, we're better able to withstand that because of the work that we did. Now, we're really, we, so we've done the crisis management, we've done the stabilization, we've done the near-term recovery, and now our focus is on transformation, more investment to make them even more effective educationally and to have them operate even more effectively as the enterprises that they are. Yeah, but, you know, I heard a lot of things coming together there. Um, really, uh, the improved financial condition of many of these colleges and universities, in part infusions of money from the government, but you've also just gotten a lot, a lot more private sector, corporate and individual and foundation support in the wake of George Floyd and what's called the, you know, the racial awakening of this country. We've seen so much more financial support for these colleges and universities. There's always room for more, of course, but there, it's been significant. Yeah. And then for a variety of reasons, uh, socially and culturally, as you said, we've seen more and more young students think that an HBCU is the place where they're going to really find their best educational opportunity. 
So if I put all these things together, you know, <laughs> we nobody writes more about cycles than we do. Is this is this more of like a cyclical moment, or do you think this is a movement, um, and that this is a change, and that uh, HBCUs are really poised to play an even bigger role going forward than they have in the past? Well, you know, uh, I guess I could say I'm hoping, but as you know, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you know. So, our in, so we're being very intentional and strategic about this. We believe that this can be a movement and not a moment, but we have to really be very intentional and determined to make that happen. So, you know, I, so what are we doing? One, we're, we're making the case and tell, telling the story about the impact of HBCUs, and we're making the business case for more investment in them. And I, I would say that that business case and the recognition in America's inter, you know, free enterprise system that talent is premium, is required, is needed, um, I think is almost creating a perfect moment for us to get more people to say, you know, at, at the beginning of, of this, people would come and say, we want your best students. And I say, well, you haven't earned the right to get our best students. Why don't you help us produce more best students? Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that that has begun to resonate for American corporations and foundations. And they understand that they've got to invest in order to get the reward and the benefit of this. So I think there's a greater awareness that these institutions are a valuable part of the talent infrastructure of our nation. And so getting, I think, focusing on talent and producing knowledge workers and workers of the 21st century is what I think is gonna make the case for continued investment. And so that this isn't just a, a blip, this is a, a, you know, this is, this is the new way of operating. And that's certainly the way we're doing it. And, you know, I, I will tell you, I'm, I used to walk around with a small tin can. I'm work, walking around with a big bucket. And, and the, the, the investments are significant, but it's really not just the financial giving. It's the partnerships we're developing with industries, uh, with corporations, and the commitment I'm seeing now from philanthropy. You know, there's a lot of huge wealth in this country. And, yeah, I, and a lot of that has come out of the you know, the folks in Silicon Valley and the tech industry. And I've been working with a lot of those donors over the last 16 years and or 18 years that I've been at UNCF. And it was hard making the case. But when we got a $120 million gift from Reed Hastings and his wife, Patty Quillen, and Reed is the founder of Netflix. Mm -hmm. You know, what people don't understand about Reed is he's really been somebody who has been focused not just on innovation in the tech space, He's been focused on innovation in education. A lot of his time, attention, and resources, and where I met him, is on the KIPP Foundation board. He's been really believing that charter schools are a lever for change. And I would say to him, Reed, HBCUs were the charter schools of the 19th century. You need to connect. He didn't quite believe me, but when I got him to actually go visit Spelman and Morehouse and Clark Atlanta University, when he saw and heard from students who had gone to KIPP academies and they said, I could have gone anywhere to college, but this was the place for me. He started saying, let me understand that. And when he wound up, they ended their, their day long visit having dinner with uh, Mary Schmidt Campbell, who's the president's Spellman, and the chair of her board, Roz Brewer. It was like, <laughs> they said, we understand now. You know, and, and I think if we can get more of American philanthropy and leadership to really see these as valuable assets in improving not just the outcomes at the institutions, but outcomes for our nation. I think we're gonna see more investment. Right, right. Now, um, Michael, you know it wouldn't be Bridgewater if you didn't have at least one slightly uncomfortable question. So, okay. so, so here it comes, here it comes. Uh, you know, it, I'm picking up on this theme of the, the increase in, in donors and philanthropy and what have you. And the gift from Reed Hastings and his wife was amazing. I do remember reading about that. I have to go back a little ways, but I think it's a particularly good example for this, for this question. Um, 
somewhere in the mid 210s, 2010s, uh, I'm, I'm told UNCF got a pretty sizable gift from Koch Industries right. and the Charles Koch Foundation. Yeah. And when you look at sort of the differences and the fundamental mission and philosophy across maybe the two organizations, that drew a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. And it can raise a question. Not, I mean, I pick out that gift. It's not, you know, I don't, I'm less mm-hmm. pointing on that than making the general point. It's like, how do you think about the, the financial support when it comes from sources that maybe are philosophically really not aligned or even maybe misaligned with UNCF um, and some of the things that you value and some of the things that are core to your mission? Well, you know, I would say that uh, we have a very firm belief at UNCF mm-hmm. that we're not Republican, we're not Democrat, we're not conservative, we're not liberal. Uh, we are not bipartisan, we are nonpartisan. Mm-hmm. And we have, we, we have values, we believe in integrity, but we also believe deeply in opportunity. And we believe that the work we do is the work of the nation. And we believe everyone should support us. And when, uh, to be honest with you, I had been trying to get a gift from the Koch brothers from the time that they bought Georgia Pacific, because I was an elected official in Atlanta when Georgia Pacific moved and built a big headquarters there. And I knew that company very well. Mm-hmm. And one of my students, the guy I taught at Morehouse, the first year I started teaching in 1969 was named Curly Dossman. And Curly was um, at Coke Industries. He was their external affairs guy. He was their social impact guy. Mm-hmm. And I said, Curly, uh, you know, what about supporting HBCUs? And, 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 and he helped us establish a communication with Charles Koch, mm-hmm. uh, the older of the two Koch brothers and now the survivor. And if you know anything about Charles, Charles is not particularly political. Uh, his brother David was more, more of a libertarian, but Charles is, um, you know, he's got multiple degrees from, from MIT. He, is uh, he believes in earned opportunity. And I, when he's talking about earned opportunity and he's a big fan of Frederick Douglass, I said, I think I can do business with this guy. I said, There's, I don't agree with him on everything. He doesn't agree with me on everything, but, but we, we agree on some core op- issues and opportunity is one of them. Mm-hmm. And he believes that, and, and, he, and then when he started meeting our students, he got really excited about their talent and their capabilities. And when he saw that the main obstacle to their success was financial, he said, I can fix that. Mm-hmm. I can deal with it. And people would say to me, well, I'll bet you he's, uh, you know, influencing what these students think. I said, you obviously have not met our students because they are independent thinkers. Right. I, I remember we did a program where he did a town hall with all of the Koch scholars at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And those young people challenged his thinking and he challenged them right back. Mm -hmm. And they had robust discussions. They didn't agree, but when they got through with that, they could still embrace, they could, the students could still say, thank you. And he could say, I really think you're a a wonderful young person. And by the way, we're, we're looking for more talent at Coke Industries. Got it. Got it. Well, that, that's a great, that's a great story. I want to, I want to pick up on the piece of that, that, you know, his focus was on the cost of this education and some, that's something he could fix. And you talked about it a lot before. So this next question comes from uh, one of the folks listening in and it, it probably takes you beyond your literal role as um, president and CEO of UNCF and maybe into a broader policy question, but there's been a lot of, talk and discussion uh, and, and some initiatives around uh, forgiving student debt, canceling student debt. And I think there's some folks that would love to hear your view uh, on that and whether you think uh, w- that's, a, that's a wise policy, important, essential. How would you think about it? Well, um, I think that the way the United States has done Uh, financing of education through debt has been inept. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if, if, if you were an, in Australia and you borrowed money to go to college, uh, you would have automatic payroll deduction from the time you graduated, taking a percentage of your income based on your income to repay your loan. Mm -hmm. And if you went to, but if you went to school in the United States, you'd have to apply for income-based repayment. You, I mean, it's, and there would be five or six different programs that your loan could have come from. And it wouldn't be, you know, and they'd have to establish what you were earning. It wasn't based on your, you know, just because we know that, you know, it, it's just a part of your payroll. It's a federal program. So I do think we have a very badly managed college debt program. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that a lot of students have worked hard to get a good education and they're not getting the benefits, full benefits of it. I believe there should be some uh, debt, re debt forgiveness. The president can give up to $10,000 in debt forgiveness. I think he ought to do that. Uh, I think it would be good for the American economy. I think it would be good for the, 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 the borrowers. I also think that the, 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 there's also been a lot of discussion about free college. I don't necessarily believe in free college, but we have a great scholarship program called the Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was started in 1965 and it's an income-based if if scholarship for low-income students. Uh, right now it's about $6,000 a year. Uh, we've been arguing for doubling the Pell Grant. So it's around $12,000 to $13,000 a year for all low-income learners. And, and I like that a lot better than saying free college because free college can be for wealthy people or for middle-class people who don't need it or for low-income people. I think we should be targeting people on the bottom to help them move out of being on the bottom. And so I believe uh, a better for loan forgiveness program a better repayment plans for the actual people who have borrowed and more uh, Pell Grants, increasing the Pell Grant. You know, I, I got a, a full tuition scholarship when I went to Morehouse. My dad paid, he, I said, well, you know, room and board back then, you'll, believe, you'll love this, is $600 a semester. <laughs> and, and he said, I'm going to pay the first year, but you got five brothers and sisters behind you. So after year one, you got to figure it out yourself. And so I worked the entire time I was in college. I did work study and I also borrowed. When I got my first job at Morehouse, a year after graduating, I had my master's. I was paid $6,200 a, a year. That was my annual salary at Morehouse. <laughs> but they also started, I had to repay my loans. I had about $2,000 in loans. I paid them off. That was the best $2,000 I ever borrowed in my life. It was a reasonable amount to repay. You know, I was making 6,200, it was a third of my, but I paid it off and I have moved steadily up because of my education into a more significant income uh, level. But I, that, that was a great, that was debt I should have borrowed. I should, nobody should have given it to me. It's enabled me to have a great career. So I think students should have some skin in the game and they get some skin in the game by helping to pay for their education, by borrowing. But right now they have to borrow too much. They have too much skin in the game. And I think it's stopping people from buying a home. It's stopping people from moving into the middle class. So I think we got to fix that. And I hope that this president is going to do that. Got it. Great. All right. I'm going to ask you two questions to wrap up with. And they're basically oriented around what industry and individuals can do, have done. Uh, one, I, I want to take a more kind of, uh, um, you know, dollars or financial driven uh, approach. And then the second, I just want to talk about what about things beyond money? Mm -hmm. So the first, first question is, you know, lots of corporations, uh, big and small, have given money, initiated scholarships, or started other programs with HBCUs, especially in the last, you know, 24 months or so. Um, is there anything or any number of things that you've seen where you would say, boy, that's a great blueprint. That is yeah. really working and it should be replicated. 
So that's, that's my question number one. I'll let you answer that. So, and Mark asked a, a question that I'm going to kind of use as a point of answering. He said, you know, a lot of colleges are not, I mean, a lot of people are not thinking about getting a college degree. They're thinking about credentials and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think that um, what more corporations could do is to work to bring more interns into their companies. Mm -hmm. uh, because particularly for low-income first-generation Black kids and, and brown kids, they need to see the connection between what they learn in the classroom and what they will earn when they get out of the classroom. And, and, and actually, there's, there's, there's a lot of research that says when you can make a connection between what you're learning and what you aspire to do, you actually work harder to learn more. And you are more effective at becoming a, a great student. So I think that companies should actually start internship programs much earlier. They should really be, be looking for, they should, they should start the talent, not just that they're looking for somebody who's gonna come work for them, but they're helping people get a sense that there's a big world out there and there's a world of opportunity. I think also that companies that have, uh, you know, we want people who have the general education that's represented by an undergraduate degree, but here are some very specific skills that we think people should have. I think they should be working with education, including HBCUs, to create credentials and badges and to, to enable faculty to teach those, the, the courses which enable them to earn these credentials and badges so that young people are actually beginning to do something they're gonna have to do throughout their, their lives. And that is to, re, to get reskilled and upskilled uh, for the work that they're gonna do. So I think that, that companies typically are, you know, by the time somebody starts teaching something at a college, it's kind of stale. It's not the latest, latest. So I think more of that and I'm excited, you know, I'm watching Google, uh, you know, say, you know, we want more people to get an understanding of basic technology. And we've got some things that, you know, if, if, if they pick up these, these skills, if they get these badges, they get these credentials, they can actually get very good jobs mm -hmm. that are tech jobs in the 21st century, even though they're not software engineers. So I think there is a lot of there's more opportunity, particularly around the use of technology and specific skills and knowledge that I think we need to have on our college campuses and companies can help say, you know, everybody should be taking this course in supply chain management. Everybody, people should be taking these other courses that will make them more competitive in the 21st century. Great. And I, I think uh, you said this, uh, I think in that answer, you at least substantially, I think, pretty much answered Mark's question as well, which is about universities rethinking the four-year uh, baccalaureate model. Well, let me just tell you, universities yeah. better start doing it because mm -hmm. what I think the marketplace is going to say, when somebody is saying to you, you get th these four credentials and you can come work from, and you demonstrate that you have the capacity, you have the skills and proficiency in those credentials, we're not asking to see your bachelor's degree. We're asking to see you do that. I have a daughter who is a software engineer. She went to, she got, she had two years of computer science at Howard when she told me, I think I've learned everything I can learn at Howard. I'm going to just stay out here in Silicon Valley. And, and she, she, she did through internships and, uh, and other uh, online courses. She got, she is now, a senior software engineer at Lyft, mm -hmm. black female without a degree. They're not asking her, can we see your Howard diploma? They're giving her a, an authentic interview and saying, Does, you know, we want you to write this code for us. And, if, and, and we want to see how efficient and elegant that is. And that's the basis on which we're going to hire you. It's not on that degree. So I think that, that colleges and universities are going to see that, you know, that they've got to add some of those real world skills and capabilities uh, if that degree is going to continue to be worth what a lot of students are having to pay for. Makes a lot of sense. Michael, we're at time, but I want to give you the last word. No question, just any uh, last words, wisdom, whatever you'd like to share with this yeah. Bridgewater group. Well, I would just say to this, because you know Bridgewater is a, a place that teaches 
that that every day creates value and uh, for your clients. Uh, and, and you do that around finance. I think that my value is that we live in a world of human potential, mm-hmm. which if we really focus more on developing that potential, we live in a world of abundant human capability. Mm-hmm. I, I saw where Bridgewater is doing a program with uh, Barnard College to get women students to think about finance and a bunch of the and, and the kind of data and analysis that is important in your industry. And I think you're going to find that women can be extraordinary in those areas, but oftentimes aren't encouraged. In fact, are discouraged from it. And what we're going to find is that women have the same abundant human potential to do this if given abundant opportunities to learn. And so I would say to to Bridgewater and to the people who are here, let's create a a world of abundant human opportunity. And if we do that by really investing in education, uh, we're not going to worry about scarcity of resources because that abundant human potential is going to create a more abundant world and a better world. And one where people aren't seeing that it's me against you or it's zero sum, they're going to say it's going to be additive. And that's the world that I think we're, that I'm committed to, to trying to build. And I can only do that in partnerships with great companies like Bridgewater. Well, great. Those are fantastic parting comments, Michael. I just want to really thank you for taking some time to spend with us today to share not only your personal thoughts uh, on education and community and the talent, uh, but also just bringing the story of UNCF and historically black colleges to a wider audience. So thanks for all the work you're doing. Uh, Continued good luck. And uh, we appreciate your time today. And just remember, a mind is a terrible Terrible thing to to waste. But a wonderful (laughs) thing to invest in. Thank you. (laughs) I love it. Thank you. (laughs) Take care, man.